What's up, everyone? Hope you're all doing great. Remember, to laugh a little, it's good for the soul. Welcome back to Darkest Dark Web Horror Stories. I love reading your comments, so feel free to say hi, share suggestions, or just lurk. Don't forget to show your support by liking the video and subscribing if you haven't already. And with that said, enjoy the stories. I never meant to find that messed up corner of the dark web, but once I saw what those crazy bastards were doing, I couldn't look away. It started on a boring Tuesday night. I was surfing the web, looking for some new physics papers to read. Yeah, I'm that kind of nerd. Sue me. Anyway, I stumbled on this forum talking about gravity manipulation. At first I thought it was just the usual crackpot pseudoscience crap. But something caught my eye. These guys were discussing actual equations. Complex stuff about warping space-time on a local scale. It was way beyond the typical conspiracy theory garbage. This was real physics. Cutting-edge theory that even I barely understood. I dug deeper, following links and decoding encrypted messages. Before I knew it, I was in way over my head on the dark web. The stuff I found there scared the hell out of me. There was this whole community of people experimenting with localized gravity fields. They called them gravity bubbles. Sounds like science fiction bullshit, right? I wish it was. These lunatics had actually figured out how to manipulate gravity in small areas. At first it seemed kinda cool. They were using the bubbles to do wild stuff like float objects, create zero-g environments, even amplify gravity in tiny spots. But then I saw the truly fucked up ways they were using this power. Some sickos were trapping animals in high gravity bubbles, watching them get crushed. Others were using low gravity fields to spy on people through walls. And don't even get me started on the creeps using gravity manipulation for sexual stuff. I wanted to puke. The worst part? They had no clue what they were messing with. Playing around with the fundamental forces of nature like it was a fucking video game. I ran the numbers and realized the horrible truth. All those gravity bubbles were having a cumulative effect. These idiots were literally pushing the earth out of its orbit, bit by bit. I tried warning them. Made an account on their forum and laid out the data. Showed them how they were slowly killing us all. You know what those assholes did? They laughed, called me a troll and banned me. That's when I knew I had to stop them myself. But how the hell does one physics nerd shut down a whole dark web community? I was totally out of my depth. Give me equations any day, but this cloak and dagger shit? Not my thing. I needed help, but I couldn't go to the authorities. They'd either think I was nuts or try to weaponize the gravity tech themselves. Typical government BS. No. I had to handle this on my own somehow. I spent the next week barely sleeping, glued to my computer. I dug through every scrap of info I could find, trying to locate these gravity hackers in the real world. It wasn't easy. These bastards were paranoid and good at covering their tracks, but they slipped up. One guy posted a photo of his gravity bubble setup. Dumbass didn't scrub the metadata. I traced it to a small town in Nevada. It wasn't much, but it was a start. I packed a bag, withdrew my savings, and bought a one-way ticket to Vegas. What the hell was I thinking? I had no plan. No backup. Just a crazy mission to save the world from a bunch of physics-wielding psychos. Little did I know, I wasn't the only one hunting them. As my plane took off, I noticed a guy a few rows back watching me. He looked away quick, but I caught his eyes. Cold. Calculating. Predatory. I realized then that this wasn't just about saving the Earth. It was about surviving long enough to do it. What had I gotten myself into? The Nevada heat hit me like a punch in the face as I stepped off the plane. Sweat soaked my shirt before I even reached the taxi stand. This was gonna suck. I caught a ride to a cheap motel on the outskirts of town, the kind of place where they don't ask questions when you pay cash. 
perfect for a guy on a crazy mission like mine. As I tossed my bag on the lumpy bed, my mind raced. How the hell was I going to find these gravity freaks? It's not like I could just look up psychophysics cult in the phone book. I fired up my laptop and dove back into the dark web. Hours passed as I sifted through forum posts and encrypted messages. My eyes burned, but I couldn't stop. The fate of the whole damn planet was riding on this. A ping from my dark web crawler bot jolted me awake. I dozed off at the desk. The bot had found something. A meetup. These idiots were actually gathering in person to show off their gravity bubbles. The location was vague. Some abandoned warehouse in the desert. But it was happening tonight. This was my chance to catch these assholes red-handed. I grabbed my gear and headed out. The motel clerk gave me a weird look as I left. Can't blame him. I probably looked like shit warmed over. The taxi driver didn't want to take me out to the middle of nowhere, but a fat wad of cash changed his mind. As we drove deeper into the desert, my stomach churned. What the fuck was I doing? I'm a physicist, not some action hero. The driver dropped me about a mile from the coordinates. Said he didn't want to get any closer. Smart man. I hiked the rest of the way, sweating buckets in the moonlight. Finally, I saw it. An old warehouse, rusted and falling apart. But there were lights inside. Voices, too. My heart pounded as I crept closer. I found a broken window and peeked in. Holy shit. There they were. About a dozen people standing around what looked like a floating ball of water. A gravity bubble in action. They were taking turns sticking their hands in, laughing as the water distorted around their fingers. It would have been cool if it wasn't so goddamn dangerous. I pulled out my phone ready to start recording. Evidence. That's what I needed. Proof to take to someone who could shut this down. But as I raised the camera, a hand clamped down on my shoulder. I nearly pissed myself. Well, well, what do we have here? A gruff voice said. Looks like we caught ourselves a spy, boys. I was dragged inside, kicking and swearing. The group turned to stare as I was thrown to the floor. Fuck, this was bad. A tall guy with a scarred face loomed over me. Who sent you? The feds. Or was it Darkstar? I had no clue what he was talking about. Nobody sent me, I stammered. I'm just a physicist. I know what you're doing. You're messing with forces you don't understand. Scarface laughed. Oh, we understand plenty. More than you could imagine. He turned to the others. What should we do with him, folks? Test subject, maybe? My blood ran cold as I saw the gleam in their eyes. These people were beyond reason. They didn't care about the damage they were causing. As they argued about my fate, I noticed something. The gravity bubble was getting bigger, unstable. They were so caught up in arguing they didn't see the danger. I had seconds to act. I lunged for the device generating the bubble. Scarface grabbed for me, but he was too slow. I smashed the machine with all my strength. There was a blinding flash, a sensation of weightlessness, then darkness. When I came to, the warehouse was trashed. Equipment scattered everywhere, but the gravity bubble was gone and so were the lunatics who made it. I staggered outside, my head spinning. What the hell had just happened? Where did they go? As I tried to get my bearings, I saw headlights approaching fast. A black SUV screeched to a halt in front of me. The guy from the plane stepped out, pointing a gun at my head. Don't move, he barked. You're coming with me. We have a lot to discuss. Well, shit. Out of the frying pan and into the fire. What had I gotten myself into? The guy with the gun shoved me into the back of the SUV. My head was still spinning from the gravity bubble explosion. What the hell was going on? Who are you? I demanded. What do you want? He ignored me, speaking into an earpiece instead. Asset secured. Heading to extraction point. Great. I'd been secured. That didn't sound good. We drove for hours through the desert. I tried asking more questions, but Mr. Secret Agent just stared at me with those cold eyes. Eventually, I gave up and dozed off. A rough shake woke me. We'd stopped at what looked like an old military base. Armed guards were everywhere. This was some serious shit. 
They marched me into an underground bunker. The place was like something out of a spy movie. High-tech computers, people in suits rushing around. I felt seriously out of place in my sweaty t-shirt and jeans. They led me to an interrogation room and cuffed me to the table. Real friendly bunch. After what felt like hours, a stern-looking woman in a crisp suit walked in. She sat across from me, studying me like I was some kind of bug. Dr. Harrison, she said finally, do you know why you're here? I blinked in surprise. They knew who I was, because I stumbled onto some crazy gravity-bending cult, I guessed. She almost smiled. Almost. Not quite. We've been watching you for some time, Doctor. Your work on quantum gravity theory is... intriguing. Now I was really confused. My work? It's all theoretical. What does that have to do with anything? Theory becomes reality faster than you think, she said cryptically. What you discovered isn't just some crazy cult. It's a global network of scientists and engineers pushing the boundaries of physics and threatening the stability of our entire planet in the process. My jaw dropped. So you know about the orbital destabilization? Why haven't you stopped them? She leaned forward. It's not that simple. This network has infiltrated governments, corporations, even intelligence agencies worldwide. We're fighting a shadow war, Doctor. And we need your help. I laughed bitterly. My help? Lady... I'm just a physics nerd who got in way over his head. What the hell can I do? You can help us shut down their operations. Your understanding of the underlying science is crucial. We need you to work with our team to develop countermeasures. I shook my head. No way. I'm not getting involved in some cloak and dagger bullshit. I just want to go home and forget this ever happened. Her eyes hardened. That's not an option, I'm afraid. You know too much. And whether you like it or not, you're already involved. Anger flared in my chest. So what, I'm your prisoner now? Think of it more as... Protective custody, she said smoothly. The people behind this won't hesitate to eliminate anyone they see as a threat. We can keep you safe. I slumped in my chair. She was right. I was in too deep to just walk away now. Fine, I muttered. What do you need me to do? She smiled for real this time. It wasn't comforting. Welcome to the agency, Dr. Harrison. Let's get to work. The next few days were a blur. They set me up in a lab that would make NASA jealous. I worked with a team of scientists, analyzing data on gravity bubble events worldwide. The scale of it all was staggering. These assholes were popping up bubbles all over the planet, each one tiny. But the cumulative effect was pushing Earth millimeters off course every day. We ran simulations, trying to predict how long we had before the orbital shift became irreversible. The results weren't good. We had months, maybe a year at most. I barely slept surviving on coffee and pure adrenaline. This was the most important work of my life. The fate of humanity was literally in our hands. But something didn't feel right. The agency was keeping secrets. I caught whispers, snippets of conversations. There was more going on than they were telling me. One night, unable to sleep, I snuck out of my quarters. I had to know what they were hiding. I crept through the darkened halls, heart pounding. I found an unlocked office and slipped inside. Jackpot. Files everywhere. As I rifled through the papers, my blood ran cold. Holy shit. The agency wasn't trying to stop the gravity bubbles. They were trying to weaponize them. I heard footsteps approaching. Fuck. I grabbed what documents I could and bolted. I made it back to my room, mind reeling. What was I going to do now? I couldn't trust anyone here, but I couldn't let them turn this tech into a weapon. As I stared at the stolen files, I realized there was only one option. I had to get the hell out of here and find a way to stop this insanity myself. But how? This place was locked down tight. I was going to need help and the only person I could think of was the last one I wanted to trust. I took a deep breath and opened my laptop. Time to contact the dark web gravity hackers again. God help me. My hands shook as I typed out the message. Was I really gonna team up with the same psychos I'd been trying to stop? 
desperate times, I guess. I used every trick I knew to cover my tracks. If the agency caught me reaching out to the gravity hackers, I'd be royally fucked. Hours passed. No response. I was starting to think I'd made a huge mistake when my screen flashed. A reply. Prove you're for real. Create a micro-bubble in your location. We'll be watching. Shit. They wanted me to use the agency's own tech against them. This was gonna be tricky. I snuck back to the lab, heart pounding. The night guard barely glanced at me as I flashed my ID. Guess they figured the egghead scientist was just pulling another all-nighter. I fired up the gravity manipulation device we'd been using for tests. My hands were sweating as I input the coordinates for a tiny bubble right outside the base. Here goes nothing, I thought, and hit the button. For a second, nothing happened. Then alarms started blaring. Fuck. I bolted from the lab as guards came running. Back in my room, I checked my laptop. A new message blinked on the screen. Impressive. Meet us at these coordinates in one hour. Come alone or don't come at all. A map popped up, showing a spot a few miles from the base. How the hell was I supposed to get there? No time to think. I grabbed the stolen files and shoved them in my bag. The whole base was on alert now. I had minutes before they came for me. I climbed out the window, thanking my past self for staying in shape. The drop nearly busted my ankle, but I managed to limp away into the darkness. Searchlights swept the perimeter as alarms kept howling. I stuck to the shadows praying I wouldn't get caught. I made it to the fence. No way I could climb it without getting zapped. Then I saw it. A maintenance tunnel. The grate was rusted, barely hanging on. I yanked it off and squeezed inside. The tunnel stank like death, but I didn't have a choice. I crawled through God knows what, trying not to think about the critters skittering around me. After what felt like hours, I saw moonlight ahead. I tumbled out of the tunnel, gasping for fresh air. I was outside the base, but I wasn't in the clear yet. I could hear vehicles in the distance. They were searching for me. I ran. My lungs burned and my legs felt like lead, but I didn't stop. I had to make it to those coordinates. As I got closer, doubt crept in. What if this was a trap? What if the gravity hackers just wanted to kill me? Too late to back out now. I reached the meeting spot, an old gas station in the middle of nowhere. For a moment, all was quiet. Then headlights blinded me. A van screeched to a halt and the door flew open. Get in! A voice yelled. Now! I hesitated for a split second. Then I heard the agency vehicles getting closer. No choice. I jumped in. The van peeled out, kicking up dust. As my eyes adjusted, I saw I wasn't alone. Three people sat in the back with me, watching me warily. Dr. Harrison, I presume, one said. A woman mid-thirties with sharp eyes and a buzz cut. I'm Kira. That's Devin and Marcus. Welcome to the Gravity Underground. I looked at my new allies, captors. Who knew at this point? Thanks for the rescue, I guess, I said cautiously. But why help me? Last I checked, you guys wanted me dead. Kira smirked. Enemy of my enemy, Doc. We've got a common problem now. That little stunt you pulled showed us you might be useful. I bristled at that. I'm not here to be useful. I'm here to stop you lunatics from destroying the planet. The guy named Marcus laughed. Destroy the planet? Is that what the agency told you were doing? I pulled out the files I'd stolen. I know exactly what's going on. You're pushing Earth out of orbit with your gravity bubbles, and the agency wants to weaponize the tech. They exchanged glances. Devin spoke up. You've got part of the story, Doc. But there's a hell of a lot you don't know time we filled you in on what's really happening. As the van sped through the desert, they laid it all out. My head spun as I realized just how deep this rabbit hole went. One thing was clear. I jumped out of the frying pan and into a raging inferno, and the fate of the world was hanging in the balance. The van bounced along a dirt road as Kira and the others filled me in. With every word, I felt like I was falling deeper into a sci-fi novel. The gravity bubbles aren't pushing Earth off course, Devin explained. They're the only thing keeping it stable. I shook my head. That's impossible. The math doesn't... Your math is based on incomplete data. 
Kira cut in. There's a reason we've been operating in secret. The truth would cause global panic. Marcus pulled out a tablet and showed me a simulation. My jaw dropped. Holy shit, is that a massive gravitational anomaly heading straight for Earth, he confirmed. We detected it five years ago. By our calculations, it'll reach us in less than a year. I stared at the screen, my mind racing. But that would rip the planet apart, Kira finished. Yeah, that's where we come in. They explained how their network had been working to create a planetary-scale gravity shield. Each bubble was a node in a massive web, designed to deflect the anomaly. So why all the secrecy? I demanded. Why not tell the world? Devin snorted. You've seen how governments react to crisis. Panic, martial law, every country for itself. We needed to work without interference. It made a twisted kind of sense. But something still bugged me. What about the agency? Why are they after you if you're trying to save the world? Kira's face darkened. Because they're not interested in saving anyone but themselves. They want to use our tech to create a small-scale shield. Just enough to protect the global elite while the rest of humanity burns. I felt sick. The pieces were falling into place. The agency's secret files. Their desperation to control the technology. It was all to save their own asses. That's why we need you, Doc, Marcus said. You're the missing piece. Your theories on quantum gravity could be the key to amplifying our shield. My head was spinning. This morning I'd been a prisoner. Now I was humanity's last hope. Talk about a career change. All right, I said finally. I'm in. What's the plan? Kira grinned. First we get you to our main lab. Then we science the shit out of this problem. The van pulled up to what looked like an abandoned missile silo. But inside was a high-tech facility that put the agency's setup to shame. For the next few weeks, I worked harder than I ever had in my life. We ran simulations, built prototypes, argued theories. Progress was slow, but we were getting there. Then came the day it all went to hell. Alarms blared through the facility. On the monitors, we saw a fleet of black vehicles approaching fast. Fuck! Kira swore. How'd they find us? I felt a chill. Had they tracked me somehow? Doesn't matter, Devin said grimly. We need to evacuate. Now. We grabbed what we could and ran for the escape tunnels. Explosions rocked the facility behind us. The agency wasn't playing around. We emerged in a hidden garage and piled into a reinforced SUV. As we peeled out, I saw agency troops swarming the silo entrance. Where are we going? I yelled over the engine's roar. Plan B! Kira shouted back. We're taking this Operation Mobile! For days, we stayed on the move, working from laptops, stealing internet where we could. It wasn't ideal, but we were making progress. Then Marcus made a breakthrough. Holy shit, guys, I think I've got it! We gathered around his screen. The simulation showed our shield holding against the anomaly. We'd done it. Celebration was cut short by the sound of helicopters. Somehow they'd found us again. We've got to split up! Kira ordered. They can't catch us all. My heart raced as we divvied up the data. The fate of the world split between four hard drives. As we prepared to go our separate ways, Kira grabbed my arm. Be careful, Doc. Trust no one. We'll rendezvous in two weeks. Don't be late. With that, we scattered into the night. I clutched my hard drive knowing the weight it carried. I had the key to saving humanity. Now I just had to stay alive long enough to use it. I'd never been on the run before. Turns out it sucks ass. Every shadow made me jump. Every passing car could be them coming for me. I ditched my phone, used only cash, and slept in shitty motels under fake names. The hard drive felt like it was burning a hole in my pocket. All that data, all those lives depending on it. The pressure was like a weight on my chest, making it hard to breathe. I kept moving, never staying in one place more than a night. I must have looked like hell, unshaven, clothes wrinkled, dark circles under my eyes. But I couldn't risk stopping. One week in, I almost got caught. I was grabbing a quick bite at a truck stop when I saw them. Two guys in suits asking the cashier questions, showing my picture. I bolted out the back, heart pounding. 
They must have spotted me because I heard shouts and footsteps behind me. I ran like my ass was on fire, ducking through alleys and jumping fences. I lost them, but it was close. Too close. After that, I went full paranoid. Stayed off the main roads. Slept in abandoned buildings. I was a mess, but I was alive. And I still had the drive. As the rendezvous date got closer, I started to worry. What if it was a trap? What if the others had been caught? But I didn't have a choice. This was bigger than me. I had to risk it. The meeting spot was an old warehouse outside of Chicago. As I approached, every instinct screamed at me to run. But I pushed on. The place looked deserted. Had I gotten the location wrong? Then I heard a whisper. Doc, that you? I nearly jumped out of my skin. It was Devin, looking as rough as I felt. Jesus, you scared the shit out of me, I hissed. Where are the others? His face fell. Marcus. They got him. Kira's inside. Come on. My stomach dropped as I followed him in. Marcus caught. God, I hoped he hadn't talked. Kira was hunched over a laptop, looking like she hadn't slept in days. She managed a tired smile when she saw me. Glad you made it, Doc. We were starting to worry. I pulled out my hard drive. I've got the data. Please tell me that's enough to finish this. She nodded. It should be, but we've got a new problem. Of course we did. Why would anything be easy? The anomaly, she said grimly. It's accelerating. We've got less time than we thought. I felt the blood drain from my face. How long? Two days, maybe three. Fuck, fuckity, fuck, fuck. So what do we do? I asked, trying to keep the panic out of my voice. Kira took a deep breath. We've got one shot. There's a satellite array in Alaska. If we can upload our program to it, we can generate the shield in time. And if we can't, Devin asked quietly. She didn't answer. She didn't have to. We got to work, feverishly combining our data and refining the program. Hours blurred together as we raced against the clock. Finally, after God knows how long, we had it. A flash drive containing humanity's last hope. I'll take it, I said. You two are better with computers. You need to be the ones to upload it. Kira started to argue, but Devin cut her off. He's right. We'll have a better chance if we split up. We said our goodbyes, knowing it might be the last time we saw each other. As I turned to leave, Kira grabbed my arm. Be careful, Doc, she said softly. And thanks for everything. I managed to smile. See you on the other side of this. Hopefully. As I stepped out into the night, the weight of the world in my pocket, I took a deep breath. One last leg of this insane journey. Time to finish what we started. Time to save the world. The Alaskan wind cut through my jacket like it wasn't even there. I shivered, clutching the flash drive in my pocket. So close now. Just had to make it to the satellite array. I'd borrowed a beat-up truck from a bar parking lot. Felt bad about it, but hey. Saving the world and all that. The old rust bucket chugged along icy roads, headlights cutting through the darkness. My mind raced. Were Kira and Devin okay? Had they made it to the array? And what about the agency? Were they on my tail? A glance in the rearview mirror answered that last question. Headlights. Gaining fast. Shit! I stomped on the gas. The truck protested but picked up speed. The chase was on. My piece of crap truck against their sleek black SUVs. Not great odds. I swerved around curves. Tires slipping on the ice. One wrong move and I'd go flying off a cliff. But I couldn't slow down. A bullet pinged off my side mirror. Fuck! These guys weren't playing around. I saw the turnoff for the array up ahead. Almost there. Just had to lose these assholes. An idea hit me. A stupid, dangerous idea. But I was all out of smart ones. I yanked the wheel hard, skidding off the road. The truck plowed through the snow, heading straight for a steep slope. This is gonna suck, I muttered. I threw open the door and hurled myself out just as the truck went over. I hit the snow hard, tumbling down the hill. Pain shot through my body as I finally came to a stop. Everything hurt. But I was alive. I looked up to see my pursuers stopped at the top of the hill, searching for me. No time to rest. I pulled myself up and limped towards the array. Had to keep moving. The massive satellite dishes loomed ahead, stark against the night sky. As I got closer, 
I heard the sounds of a fight. I crept around a building to see Kira and Devin in hand-to-hand -hand combat with agency goons. They were holding their own, but outnumbered. I had to help, but how? I'm a physicist, not a fighter. Then I spotted it. The control room. If I could get in there and upload the program, none of the rest would matter. I took a deep breath and made a run for it. Shots rang out behind me, but I didn't look back. Just ran like hell. I slammed into the control room door, fumbling with the keypad. Shit! I needed a code. More gunshots outside. I was out of time. Screw it. I smashed the butt of my gun against the keypad. Sparks flew, and the door clicked open. I dove inside, slamming the door behind me. Rows of computers greeted me. Now for the hard part. I jammed the flash drive in and got to work. Lines of code flew across the screen as I initiated the upload. A pounding on the door. They were trying to break in. Come on, come on, I muttered. The progress bar crept forward agonizingly slow. The door burst open. I spun to see a gun pointed at my head. The woman from the agency sneered at me. Step away from the computer, Dr. Harrison, it's over. I raised my hand slowly. You don't understand. This isn't what you think. We're trying to save... Save it, she snapped. We know exactly what you're doing and we can't allow it. My mind raced, had to keep her talking, buy more time. So that's it, I said. You'll let the world burn just to save your own asses? She shrugged. The world's always burning, Doctor. We're just making sure the right people survive. You're insane, I spat. You can't possibly... A beep from the computer cut me off. The upload was complete. The woman's eyes widened. She lunged for the computer, but it was too late. The ground shook. Outside, the sky lit up with a shimmering curtain of energy. The shield was online. No! She screamed, turning her gun on the computer. I tackled her, sending us both sprawling. We grappled for the weapon as the room shook around us. Suddenly, everything went still. The shaking stopped. The glow outside faded. We froze, staring at each other. Had it worked? Or had we just witnessed the end of the world? Slowly, I stood up. I walked to the window on shaky legs and looked out. The night sky looked normal. No signs of destruction. No gravitational chaos. We'd done it. We'd actually fucking done it. I let out a laugh that was half sob. It was over. We'd saved the world. I turned back to the agency woman still on the floor. It's done. You lose. She looked at me for a long moment, then dropped her gun. What happens now? I sighed, suddenly bone-tired. Now, now we've got a hell of a lot of explaining to do. As if on cue, sirens wailed in the distance. The cavalry was coming. Late to the party as usual, I slumped into a chair, the adrenaline fading. We'd won, but the fight was far from over. The world deserved to know the truth, but that was a problem for tomorrow. Right now, I just wanted to close my eyes and sleep for about a year. As unconsciousness took me, my last thought was of Kira and Devin. I hoped they were okay. We had one hell of a story to tell. The end, for now. I never thought I'd be a whistleblower. Hell, I never even thought I'd be a chef. My father was a plumber. My mother a school teacher. But somewhere along the line, I got the bug for cooking. And not just any cooking. I was obsessed with flavors, the ones that make your taste buds explode and leave you craving more. I wanted to create dishes that could change people, that could make them feel something they'd never felt before. And I was good at it. Damn good. But what I found on the dark web, that was something else entirely. It all started with a late night search for inspiration. I'd been hitting a creative wall. My dishes were starting to feel ordinary. I was looking for something different, something that would shake me up, pull me out of the rut. I found more than I bargained for. It was called The Entangled Kitchen, just a page at first, hidden deep in a forum I'd never seen before. The kind of place where you had to know someone who knew someone to even get the link. The layout was minimal, just black text on a white background, like some ancient recipe book. But the words were... strange. They described flavors I couldn't even imagine. Tastes that defied logic, with ingredients that didn't make sense. At first I thought it was a joke. 
quantum entanglement? In cooking? I mean, I'd heard the term before. Knew it had something to do with particles behaving in ways that didn't line up with how the universe was supposed to work. But applying that to food? It sounded like some sci-fi bullshit. But the more I read, the more I couldn't tear my eyes away. The recipes were written in a way that was almost hypnotic. They described dishes that would change you, that would unlock something deep inside your mind. They promised sensations beyond what we mere mortals could handle, and they came with warnings, serious ones. These weren't just dishes, they were experiences, and they came with a cost. But I was hooked. I couldn't stop thinking about it. I needed to know if it was real. So I decided to try one of the simpler recipes, just to see what would happen. The ingredients were bizarre, almost impossible to find. It took weeks of searching, and a few questionable transactions with some shady characters, but I finally had everything I needed. The recipe was for something called Untangled Bouillabaisse, a French fish stew, but twisted warped into something new. As I started cooking, I felt... different. The air around me seemed to hum, like the universe was paying attention. When I added the final ingredient, a dash of something I still can't name, the pot began to shimmer. I swear it was glowing just for a second, but it was enough. I served it to my friend Max, the poor bastard. He was a foodie always down to try something new, so he didn't hesitate when I handed him the bowl. He took one bite, then another, and his eyes went wide. For a moment, he looked ecstatic, like he just tasted heaven itself. But then, his face twisted in pain. He started to shake, his hands gripping the table like he was holding on for dear life. His mouth opened, but no sound came out just this silent scream that chilled me to the bone. And then, as suddenly as it started, he stopped. His face went blank, eyes dull, like the life had just drained out of him. I rushed to him, but he didn't respond. He was breathing. His heart was beating, but he wasn't there anymore. Just an empty shell. I stood there staring at what used to be my friend and felt a wave of horror wash over me. What the hell had I done? What kind of nightmare had I unleashed? I knew, right then and there, that I needed to stop this. Whatever the entangled kitchen was, it was dangerous, and it had to be shut down. But as I sat there, with Max's lifeless eyes staring back at me, I realized something else. This wasn't just about stopping a few recipes. This was about saving reality itself, and I was the only one who could do it. The next few days were a blur of fear and guilt. Max was alive physically, but mentally, he was gone. His wife thought he'd had a stroke and the doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong. They said it was like his brain had just shut off. I didn't tell them about the bouillabaisse. What could I say? Hey, I fed your husband a quantum fish stew that fried his mind. They'd lock me up, no question. But I couldn't let it go. I kept going back to that page on the dark web, looking for answers. Every time I read through those recipes, it felt like I was getting closer to something. There was a pattern to the ingredients, a rhythm to the steps. They weren't just random, they were deliberate, designed to do something. Something big. I needed to know more. I had to understand what I was dealing with. But the deeper I dug, the more dangerous it got. The forum where I'd found the recipes had other threads. Discussions about the entangled kitchen and its origins. Most of it was vague, filled with cryptic warnings and half-mad ramblings. But a few posts stood out. There was talk of a master chef, someone who had perfected the art of quantum cuisine. According to the posts, this chef had discovered a way to manipulate reality itself through food. By using quantum entanglement, they could create dishes that transcended the physical world, altering the very fabric of existence. But these weren't just culinary experiments, they were weapons. And the chef was using them to push the limits of what reality could handle. I knew I had to find this chef. If I could confront them, 
Maybe I could stop this madness before it went too far. But finding someone who operates on the dark web is easier said than done. I spent hours, days, trawling through encrypted messages and dead ends. But finally, I found a Lita reference to a hidden restaurant in Paris. One that catered to the elite, serving dishes that weren't on any normal menu. It was called Le Cauchemar, the nightmare. Fitting, I thought. I booked a flight to Paris, my heart pounding with a mix of fear and determination. This was insane, I knew that. But I couldn't just sit back and let this go. I had to do something, even if it meant risking my own life. The restaurant was located in a narrow alley in the 11th arrondissement, away from the tourist traps. It looked unassuming, just a small door with no sign, nothing to indicate what lay inside. But when I stepped through that door, I entered another world. The dining room was dimly lit, with shadows that seemed to move on their own. The air was thick with the smell of rich, exotic spices, and the low murmur of voices filled the space. The clientele was well-dressed, their faces a mix of anticipation and unease. They were here for something special, something forbidden. A waiter approached me, his face a mask of polite indifference. I asked for a table, and he led me to a small booth in the corner. As I sat down I noticed the menu on the table. There were no prices, just a list of dishes, each more bizarre than the last. The shifting sands, the echo of eternity, the abyssal feast. The descriptions were vague, but the implications were clear. These weren't just meals, they were experiences, and not all of them were meant to be pleasant. I ordered the simplest thing on the menu, something called the memory of salt. The waiter nodded and disappeared into the kitchen. As I waited, I looked around, trying to see if I could spot the master chef. But no one in the room looked like a culinary genius or a madman. When the dish arrived, it was underwhelming. Just a small plate of what looked like sea salt, arranged in a delicate pattern. But as I tasted it, I felt a wave of nostalgia wash over me. I was back in my grandmother's kitchen, a child again, tasting the salt off her fingertips as she cooked. It was so vivid so real, that I almost forgot where I was, but then the memory shifted, darkened. My grandmother's face twisted into something grotesque, her eyes hollow and empty. The kitchen around me decayed, the walls crumbling into dust. I felt a cold hand on my shoulder, pulling me back to reality. I was shaking, my heart pounding in my chest. The waiter was standing beside me watching with an expressionless face. The chef will see you now, he said quietly. I nodded, trying to steady my breath. This was it, the moment of truth. I followed the waiter through a door at the back of the dining room, down a narrow hallway lined with old photographs. The faces in the photos were blurred, distorted, as if the images had been tampered with. I felt a chill run down my spine. We reached a door at the end of the hall and the waiter knocked twice. A voice from within beckoned us in, and the door swung open to reveal a small, dimly lit kitchen. Standing at the stove was a figure in a white chef's coat. They're back to us. The smell of something rich and intoxicating filled the air. The figure turned, and I saw the face of the master chef. It was a face I recognized. I froze in the doorway, staring at the figure in front of me. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The master chef, the person responsible for all this madness, was someone I knew, someone I had once called a friend. It was Jean-Luc. We had worked together years ago, back when I was just starting out as a line cook in a small Parisian bistro. He was the head chef, a genius in the kitchen with an uncanny ability to combine flavors in ways that defied logic. He had taught me so much, had been my mentor. But he had disappeared one day without a word, leaving behind only rumors of some new culinary journey he was embarking on. And now, here he was, standing in front of me, stirring a pot of something that smelled like heaven and hell combined. Jean-Luc? I managed to choke out. What the fuck are you doing here? 
He looked up at me, his eyes glinting with a mix of amusement and something darker. Ah, my old friend, he said, his voice smooth as butter. I see you found your way to my little experiment. Experiment? You're playing with people's lives, Jean-Luc? I spat, anger and fear twisting in my gut. What the hell happened to you? What is all this? He chuckled, setting the spoon down and wiping his hands on a towel. I suppose you could call it an experiment, yes. But it's more than that. It's a revolution. A new frontier in culinary arts. I've discovered a way to transcend the limits of traditional cooking, to create flavors that alter reality itself. I shook my head trying to make sense of his words. You're talking about quantum entanglement, right? Those recipes, they're dangerous, Jean-Luc. I saw what happened to Max. He raised an eyebrow, as if he was hearing about Max for the first time. Ah, yes, that was unfortunate. But necessary. You see, every dish is a step closer to perfection, but perfection requires sacrifice. Perfection? You're talking about turning people into vegetables, I yelled, my anger boiling over. You're fucking with reality, Jean-Luc. Do you even know what you're doing? He smiled, a cold, calculating smile that sent shivers down my spine. Of course I do. I'm rewriting the rules, creating something that has never been done before. The world will thank me for it, once they understand. I stared at him, realizing how far gone he was. This wasn't the Jean-Luc I had known. He had become something else, something twisted by his own ambition. I'm shutting this down, I said, my voice shaking with determination. I won't let you hurt anyone else. He laughed a deep, menacing sound that echoed off the kitchen walls. And how do you plan to do that, my friend? You can't stop what you don't understand. You're just a chef, not a scientist. I don't need to understand it, I shot back. I just need to stop you. He sighed, shaking his head. You're making a mistake. But very well, if you're so determined to play the hero, I'll give you a choice. You can walk away now, forget you ever saw this place, and go back to your life. Or, you can stay and see how deep the rabbit hole goes. I hesitated, my mind racing. Part of me wanted to run, to leave this nightmare behind and pretend it never happened. But another part of me, the part that couldn't stand by while people were being hurt, knew I couldn't walk away. I'm staying, I said firmly, and I'm going to stop you. Jean-Luc nodded as if he had expected my answer. Very well, he said softly. But be warned, you may not like what you find. He turned back to the stove, stirring the pot with a slow, deliberate motion. The air around us seemed to thicken, the shadows growing longer, darker. I felt a pressure in my chest like the very fabric of reality was tightening around us. This is just the beginning, Jean-Luc said, his voice barely above a whisper. You've tasted the appetizer. Now let me show you the main course. And with that, the world around me began to shift, to warp, as if reality itself was being pulled apart at the seams. I tried to move, to scream, but I was rooted to the spot trapped in the grip of something far beyond my understanding. Jean-Luc had opened a door, and there was no turning back. Whatever lay beyond it, I knew I was in for the fight of my life. The world around me twisted and contorted, the walls of the kitchen warping like melted wax. I felt a vertigo that threatened to tear my mind apart, but I forced myself to focus. This was Jean-Luc's doing his main course, as he called it. I needed to find a way out, but the more I tried to move, the more I realized I was trapped. The kitchen was gone, replaced by a vast, shadowy void. The floor beneath me was cold, hard, and the air smelled of burnt sugar and rot. I could hear distant whispers, voices that seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere at once. They spoke in tongues I couldn't understand, but their tone was unmistakable hunger. 
Then, out of the darkness, figures began to emerge. They were tall, thin, their faces obscured by shadows. They moved with an unnatural grace, their limbs too long, too flexible. I felt their eyes on me, cold and probing, as if they were sizing me up, deciding if I was worth consuming. I wanted to run, but my legs wouldn't move. I was paralyzed with fear, my heart pounding in my chest like a trapped animal. The figures circled me, their whispers growing louder, more insistent. I could feel their breath on my skin, cold as ice. One of them stepped forward, reaching out with a hand that was more claw than flesh. I braced myself for the end, but instead of tearing me apart, the figure placed something in my hand. It was small cold, and pulsed with a faint light, I looked down and saw that it was a key, black as night, with intricate designs carved into its surface. The moment I touched it the figures recoiled, retreating back into the shadows. The whispers faded, replaced by a heavy silence. I didn't know what the key was for, but I knew it was important. I closed my hand around it feeling its cold surface bite into my palm. As I did, the void around me began to shift again, the darkness giving way to a dim, flickering light. I was back in the kitchen, but it was different now. The walls were cracked and stained, the floor covered in a layer of dust and grime. The stove was cold, the pot on it blackened and empty. The smell of burnt food hung in the air, mixed with something else, something metallic, like blood. Jean-Luc was gone. The door at the end of the hallway was ajar and I could see a faint light spilling out from the room beyond. I knew that was where I needed to go. I walked down the hallway, the key clutched tightly in my hand. The photographs on the walls were clearer now, their faces no longer blurred. They were people I recognized friends, family, colleagues but their eyes were hollow, empty, their expressions twisted into masks of fear and pain. I reached the door and pushed it open, stepping into a small, dimly lit room. In the center of the room was a table, and on it a single dish Jean-Luc's main course. It was a roast, or at least it looked like one. The meat was charred and glistening, the skin crisped to perfection, but as I got closer, I realized something was wrong. The smell was off, a sickly sweet odor that turned my stomach, and the meat. It was moving, pulsing as if it was still alive. I felt a wave of nausea, but I forced myself to look closer. The meat wasn't just moving, it was shifting, changing shape, morphing into something else. I watched in horror as it took on the form of a face, a face I knew all too well. It was Max. His eyes were wide with terror, his mouth twisted in a silent scream. The sight of it made my blood run cold. This wasn't just a dish. It was a nightmare, a grotesque parody of life. I had to destroy it. I grabbed a knife from the table and raised it high, ready to plunge it into the heart of this abomination. But before I could strike, the door behind me slammed shut and I felt a presence in the room with me. I turned slowly, the knife still in my hand. Standing in the doorway was Jean-Luc, his face twisted into a smile that sent chills down my spine. You've come this far, he said, his voice smooth and calm. But are you ready to finish what you started? I didn't answer. I just tightened my grip on the knife and took a step forward. Jean-Luc's smile widened, and he raised his hand, revealing a small, silver key identical to the one I held. Two keys, he said softly. Two doors. One leads to salvation, the other, to oblivion. Choose wisely. My mind raced, trying to make sense of his words. But there was no time to think, no time to plan. I had to act, and I had to act now. I looked at the two keys, then at Jean-Luc. The smile on his face was gone, replaced by a cold, calculating gaze. I took a deep breath, steeled myself, and made my choice. I chose the door on the left. 
driven more by instinct than logic. The key felt like ice in my hand as I slid it into the lock. The moment it clicked into place, the door creaked open, revealing a dark corridor that seemed to stretch into infinity. Jean-Luc said nothing, but I could feel his eyes on me, watching, waiting. I hesitated for a moment, then stepped through the doorway, my heart pounding in my chest. The corridor was cold, the air thick with the stench of decay. The walls were lined with old, crumbling bricks, and the floor beneath my feet was uneven, slick with something I didn't want to identify. Every step echoed in the silence, the sound bouncing off the walls in a way that made the space feel both endless and suffocating. As I walked, I felt the world shifting around me, reality warping like it had in the kitchen. The walls seemed to pulse with a faint, sickly light, and the shadows danced in unnatural ways, twisting into shapes that didn't belong, but it was the whispers that unsettled me the most. They were faint at first, barely more than a breath against my ear, but they grew louder with each step. They spoke in a language I couldn't understand, but their tone was unmistakable malice, hunger, despair. I tried to ignore them, to focus on the path ahead, but it was impossible. The whispers were inside my head, crawling through my thoughts like worms. I could feel them burrowing deeper, feeding on my fear. My pace quickened, driven by a growing sense of urgency. I needed to find the end of this corridor, to escape this nightmare. But the further I went, the more it seemed like the corridor was leading me in circles. A twisted labyrinth with no exit, and then I saw it. A door at the far end, barely visible in the dim light. I broke into a run, desperation fueling my movements. The whispers were louder now, almost deafening, but I forced myself to keep going. I reached the door, throwing it open with a force that sent me stumbling forward into the room beyond. I fell to my knees, gasping for breath, my heart racing. The door slammed shut behind me cutting off the whispers in an instant. The room was small, barely more than a closet, with walls covered in dark, peeling wallpaper. The only light came from a single, flickering bulb hanging from the ceiling. In the center of the room was a table, and on it, another dish. But this one was different. It was simple, almost plain. Just a piece of meat, perfectly cooked, resting on a bed of greens. The smell was intoxicating, rich and savory, but there was something else beneath it, something that made my stomach turn. I knew what it was. I knew because I had cooked it a thousand times before. The dish on the table was my signature creation, the one that had made my name in the culinary world. But how was that possible? How could Jean-Luc have known? My mind raced, trying to make sense of it, but there were no answers. Only more questions. I approached the table cautiously, my eyes never leaving the dish. I could feel something in the room with me, a presence that was both familiar and alien. It pressed down on me, making it hard to breathe, hard to think. And then I heard it, a voice, soft and distant, but unmistakable. You've come so far, it said, echoing off the walls, but the journey is not yet over. I spun around, searching for the source of the voice, but there was no one there. Just the walls, closing in on me. The air thickening with every passing second. You must complete the meal. The voice continued closer now, almost at my ear. Only then will you understand. My hands trembled as I reached for the dish. I didn't want to do it. Didn't want to play Jean-Luc's twisted game. But I knew I had no choice. This was the only way to end it, to escape this nightmare. I picked up the fork and knife, my hands shaking. The meat was tender, almost melting under the blade. I took a deep breath, stealing myself, and brought the fork to my mouth. The moment the meat touched my tongue, the world exploded. Colors, sounds, sensations. I was overwhelmed by them all at once, 
a sensory overload that left me reeling. The room around me dissolved, replaced by a kaleidoscope of shifting realities, each one more surreal than the last. I saw faces my own, distorted and twisted, reflecting back at me from a thousand mirrors. I heard voices screaming, laughing, crying, all at once, a cacophony that threatened to tear my mind apart, and through it all, I felt something pulling at me, dragging me deeper into the madness. It was Jean-Luc, I realized, his presence woven into the very fabric of this twisted reality. You're almost there, his voice whispered, echoing in my mind. Just a little further. I tried to fight it, to pull back, but it was too late. I was caught in the current, being dragged towards something I couldn't see, couldn't comprehend. And then, just as suddenly as it had begun, it stopped. I was back in the room, on my knees, gasping for breath. The dish was gone, the table empty. The door behind me was open, leading into darkness. I knew what I had to do. I had to go deeper, to find the heart of this madness and end it once and for all. But as I stood up, I couldn't shake the feeling that I had just crossed a line, that I was no longer in control, and that terrified me more than anything else. I stepped through the doorway, my mind a tangled mess of fear and resolve. The darkness on the other side swallowed me whole, and for a moment I felt like I was floating in a void, untethered and lost. Then, the floor reappeared beneath my feet, smooth, cold, and disturbingly sterile. I found myself in a vast, empty space, lit only by a dim, sourceless light that seemed to seep from the very walls. The air was thick with the smell of something foul, a rancid stench that clung to my clothes and skin. I took a few cautious steps forward, and the light slowly intensified, revealing what lay ahead. My stomach twisted in revulsion, the room was a kitchen, but not like any kitchen I'd ever seen. Stainless steel counters lined the walls, covered in tools that looked more like instruments of torture than anything used for cooking. Blood-stained knives, cleavers, and saws were scattered across the surfaces, their edges glinting menacingly in the light. The floor was slick with a dark, sticky substance, pooling in places like congealed oil. In the center of the room was a long, metal table, and on it was a feast and obscene array of dishes, each more grotesque than the last. There were things on those plates that defied description, meats and organs arranged in nightmarish presentations, dripping with thick black sauces that smelled of rot and decay, and standing at the head of the table, with a sickeningly proud smile on his face, was Jean-Luc. Welcome, chef, he said, his voice dripping with mockery. You've made it to the final course. I swallowed hard, my throat dry. What is this? I demanded, my voice barely more than a whisper. What the fuck have you done? Jean-Luc's smile widened. This, my dear, is the culmination of our art. A fusion of culinary mastery and quantum entanglement. A true feast for the senses. Each dish is a masterpiece designed to push the boundaries of reality itself. I shook my head, backing away from the table. This isn't cooking. This is madness. Oh, but madness is what we strive for, isn't it? Jean-Luc replied, stepping closer. To transcend the mundane, to create something beyond comprehension, that is what we chefs live for. And you, of all people, should understand that. I felt a surge of anger but it was quickly swallowed by the overwhelming sense of dread that filled the room. You're using this, this dark web shit to twist reality, to play God. But you've gone too far. This is wrong. Jean-Luc's expression darkened. Too far. No, chef. We haven't gone far enough. There are limits to what our minds can perceive. But with these dishes, we can break those limits push past them into new realms of experience, he gestured to the table. These dishes are the key to that. They alter the fabric of reality, twist it to our will. But they're also a test a test of your resolve, 
your willingness to go beyond the ordinary. I looked at the table, at the twisted horrific dishes laid out before me. I could feel them pulling at me, tempting me, urging me to take just one bite, but I knew what that would mean. I'd seen the effects already, the way reality had warped around me, the way my thoughts had twisted. If I gave in, if I tasted even one of these abominations, I'd be lost. I won't do it, I said, my voice trembling. I won't be part of this. Jean-Luc's eyes narrowed, and for the first time, I saw a flicker of something other than confidence in his expression. Fear, perhaps, or maybe anger. You've come this far, chef. You can't turn back now. I clenched my fists, my resolve hardening. Watch me. I turned to leave, but the moment I did, the room shifted again. The walls seemed to close in, the floor tilting beneath my feet. I stumbled, catching myself on the edge of the table, my hand slipping in something warm and wet. You can't escape, Jean-Luc said, his voice cold. You're part of this now. There's no going back. The room twisted, the walls warping like melting wax. I could feel reality slipping away, dissolving into chaos. But I forced myself to move, to push through the madness. As I reached the door, I felt a hand on my shoulder, gripping me with an unnatural strength. I turned, and Jean-Luc's face was inches from mine his eyes burning with a maniacal intensity. You think you can just walk away? He hissed. You think you can defy me? I struggled against his grip, but he held me fast, his fingers digging into my flesh. You've already taken the first bite, chef. You're already mine. I felt something snap inside me, a rush of adrenaline giving me the strength to shove him away. He staggered back, his expression twisted with rage. I'm not yours! I spat, reaching for the door. And I'll end this. I'll end you. Jean-Luc's laughter echoed in the room. A low, sinister sound that sent shivers down my spine. You can try, chef, but you'll never escape what you've tasted. It's in you now, part of you, and it will consume you. I wrenched the door open and bolted through it, leaving the twisted feast behind. The darkness swallowed me again, but I didn't care. I just needed to get away, to find a way out. But deep down, I knew Jean-Luc was right. Something had changed inside me. Something dark and twisted. And no matter how far I ran, I couldn't escape it. Not as long as that taste lingered on my tongue. I ran through the darkness, the walls of reality collapsing around me. The corridors twisted and warped, bending in on themselves as if the very fabric of space was being torn apart. My footsteps echoed in the void, each one reverberating like a gunshot in the silence. I didn't know where I was going, only that I had to get away, had to find an escape before it was too late. But the taste was still there, lingering on my tongue like a curse. It was faint, almost imperceptible, but it pulsed through my veins like poison, warping my thoughts and distorting my vision. The world around me shifted in response, the walls melting and reforming in grotesque, impossible shapes. I wasn't running through a corridor anymore. I was running through a nightmare. Jean-Luc's voice echoed in my mind, taunting me. You can't run from this, chef. You're already infected. It's in you and it's spreading. I shook my head, trying to block him out. But it was no use. His presence was everywhere, woven into the very air I breathed. The darkness seemed to close in, the walls pressing against me suffocating me, and then I saw it. Another door, barely visible in the swirling chaos. My heart leaped at the sight of it, hope surging through me like a jolt of electricity. I didn't hesitate. I threw myself at the door, desperate to escape this hellish labyrinth. The door flew open, and I stumbled forward, falling to my knees on the other side. The ground was solid beneath me, the air clear and cold. I looked up, and for the first time, I saw light real, warm light, filtering through a crack in the ceiling. I was in a kitchen. Not Jean-Luc's twisted nightmare of a kitchen, but a real one. Familiar and comforting. The counters were clean, 
the knives neatly arranged, the smell of fresh herbs and roasting meat filling the air. It was the kitchen of my restaurant, the one I had built with my own hands, but something was wrong. The light was flickering, the shadows creeping in at the edges of my vision. I could feel the darkness pressing against the walls, seeping through the cracks, threatening to overtake everything. I stood up, my legs shaky, and took a step forward. The room seemed to shift around me, the walls breathing like a living thing. I reached for the counter trying to steady myself, but the moment my fingers touched the cold steel, I felt it, the taste, sharp and bitter, rising up from the depths of my mind. I pulled back my heart pounding. The taste was getting stronger, more insistent, and with it came the whispers, crawling through my thoughts like spiders. You're not done yet, chef, the voices hissed. You haven't finished the meal. I backed away from the counter, my eyes scanning the room. The light was fading, the darkness creeping closer, and then I saw it, the source of the whispers, the cause of the taste. On the counter, where nothing had been a moment before. There was a dish. It was simple. Just a single piece of meat, seared to perfection, resting on a plate. But there was something wrong with it. Something that made my skin crawl. The meat was moving. It was subtle at first. Just a faint twitch. But then it started to pulse, as if it were alive. The sight of it made my stomach churn, but the smell... God, the smell it was intoxicating. Rich and savory, it filled the room, drowning out everything else. I knew what it was. It was the final course. I wanted to run, to turn and flee, but my feet were rooted to the spot. The dish called to me, pulling me closer, the whispers growing louder, more urgent. Finish the meal, chef, they urged. Complete the cycle. I reached for the knife, my hand trembling. I didn't want to do it. Didn't want to be part of this sick game anymore. But the taste, the taste was overpowering, demanding, and I couldn't resist. With a shaking hand, I cut into the meat. Blood oozed from the cut, thick and dark, pooling on the plate. The meat quivered under the knife, almost as if it were alive. I brought the piece to my mouth, every instinct screaming at me to stop, but it was too late. The taste was already in me, driving me forward. I closed my eyes, stealing myself, and bit down. The moment the meat touched my tongue, the world shattered. The kitchen exploded in a burst of light and sound, reality fracturing into a million pieces. I was thrown back, my body slamming into the wall with bone-crushing force. Pain shot through me, but it was drowned out by the overwhelming flood of sensations that filled my mind. I was everywhere and nowhere. My consciousness ripped from my body, stretched across the fabric of space and time. I saw things, impossible things, worlds colliding, stars being born and dying in an instant, entire realities folding in on themselves. And through it all, I felt the taste, growing stronger, consuming me from the inside out. It twisted my thoughts, warping my perception until I couldn't tell where I ended, and the madness began. I was losing myself, becoming part of something much bigger, much darker. I could feel it pulling me in, dragging me down into the abyss, and then just as suddenly it was over. I was back in the kitchen, lying on the cold hard floor. The dish was gone, the counters clean, the light was steady, the shadows gone, but I knew the truth. I had finished the meal, completed the cycle, and in doing so, I had unleashed something into the world, something that couldn't be undone. I staggered to my feet, my mind reeling. The taste was gone, but the memory of it lingered, a ghost haunting the edges of my thoughts. I knew I couldn't stay here, couldn't let this place consume me. I turned and walked out of the kitchen, leaving the restaurant behind. The night was cold, the streets empty, but the darkness was everywhere, pressing in on me. I had to end this, I had to find Jean-Luc, had to stop him before it was too late. But as I walked, I couldn't shake the feeling that it was already too late. 
that the taste had already spread, infecting everything it touched. And I knew deep down that no matter where I went, no matter what I did, I would never escape it. Because the taste was part of me now, and it always would be. In the grimy corners of the internet where the light of Google doesn't shine, I found the invitation. I'm an art critic, always hunting for the next big thing, the next shockwave to rattle the art world. I'd heard whispers of an exclusive gallery on the dark web, showcasing works that could change your perception of reality. I laughed it off initially, but after a few glasses of wine and a bored night alone, I found myself digging deeper. The invitation was a simple .jpg file, a black background with white text. The gallery, one night only, tour required. Below was a string of numbers and letters, gibberish to the uninitiated, but I recognized it as a dark web address. I felt a thrill, like a kid sneaking into a haunted house. I opened my tour browser and dove in. The gallery was sleek, minimalistic, unlike the usual dark web shit show. A single line of text greeted me. Welcome, art lover 1978. Enjoy the show. I clicked on the first thumbnail, and my breath caught. It was a sculpture, a twisted figure made of what looked like rusted metal and glass. It was disturbing, yes, but also captivating. I couldn't look away. I clicked on the next image, and the next each sculpture more twisted than the last. They were like nightmares given form, and yet there was a raw, brutal beauty to them. I had to know more. I had to find the artist. I closed my laptop, my heart pounding. I needed a drink. I headed to McGlinchey's, a dive bar in Philly where I could blend in, think things through. But as I sat there nursing my whiskey, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. The world looked different somehow, sharper, more vivid. I chalked it up to the adrenaline, the thrill of discovery. But then the bar fight started. It was brutal, vicious. Two men going at each other like animals. And all I could do was watch, fascinated, as the violence unfolded. It was like art, dark, twisted art. I shook my head, snapped out of it. What the hell was wrong with me? I threw some cash on the bar and stumbled out, the screams and shouts echoing behind me. I woke up feeling like shit. My head was pounding, my mouth was dry, and my body ached like I'd been the one in the fight. I dragged myself to the bathroom, splashed water on my face, and looked in the mirror. That's when I saw it. My eyes. They were different. The color was off, a shade darker, almost black. I blinked, shook my head, but the change was still there. I chalked it up to a weird hangover and headed to work. I'm a freelancer, but I keep an office at the Philadelphia Inquirer. As soon as I stepped into the bullpen, I knew something was wrong. The usual chatter was gone, replaced by a tense silence. People were hunched over their desks, working with a feverish intensity. I glanced at one of the TVs tuned to the local news. Riots. Fires. Chaos. What the hell? I sat down at my desk, tried to focus on work but my mind kept drifting back to the gallery. Those sculptures, they were haunting me. I pulled out my laptop, opened the Tor browser. The gallery was still there, the sculptures still twisted and beautiful. But this time, they seemed familiar. Like I'd seen them before, not just online, but in real life. I shook my head, tried to focus. I had a deadline. A review of some pretentious installation art piece due by noon. But every time I started to type, my fingers froze. The words wouldn't come. All I could see were those sculptures. Those twisted figures of metal and glass. I gave up. Closed my laptop. I needed to clear my head. I stepped out of the office, into the chaos of the city. Sirens wailed in the distance. Smoke billowed from a burning building a few blocks away. People rushed past me, their faces twisted in fear, anger, confusion. I walked aimlessly, trying to make sense of it all. That's when I saw it. In an alley, tucked behind a dumpster, 
a glint of metal caught my eye. I stepped closer, my heart pounding. It was a sculpture. One of the sculptures from the gallery. I reached out, touched it. It was cold, hard, real. This wasn't a dream, a hallucination. This was real, and it was spreading. I stumbled back from the sculpture, my mind racing. How did it get here? Who put it here? I looked around, half expecting to see some creepy figure lurking in the shadows. But there was no one, just me and the twisted metal figure. I pulled out my phone, snapped a picture. I needed to find out who was behind this. I needed to find the artist. I rushed back to the office, ignoring the chaos around me. I locked myself in my cubicle, opened my laptop, and dove back into the dark web. The gallery was still there, untouched, unaffected by the chaos it was causing. I clicked through the images, looking for a clue, anything that could lead me to the artist. And then I saw it, a small icon at the bottom of the page, a contact form. I hesitated, then clicked on it. Meet the artist? The form asked. Below was a text box, a place for a message. I typed quickly, my fingers shaking. Who are you? What are these sculptures? What do they do? I hit send before I could second guess myself. The response was almost immediate. Art Lover 1978, I've been waiting for you. Meet me, tonight, 2 a.m., the Eastern State Penitentiary. I stared at the message, my heart pounding. The penitentiary, the abandoned prison in the heart of the city, it was a creepy place. A tourist attraction during the day, a haunted house at night. I swallowed hard, typed my response, I'll be there. The rest of the day passed in a blur. I tried to focus on work, but it was impossible. The sculptures, the chaos, the artist, it was all I could think about. I left the office early, headed home to prepare. I didn't know what I was walking into, but I knew I needed to be ready. I dug out my old flashlight, checked the batteries. I put on my thickest jacket, my sturdiest boots. I grabbed a can of pepper spray just in case. I looked at myself in the mirror, barely recognized the face staring back at me. I looked determined, scared, but determined. The penitentiary loomed large and dark against the night sky. I approached cautiously, my flashlight sweeping the ground in front of me. The main entrance was locked, chained shut, but there was a side door, slightly ajar, an invitation. I took a deep breath and stepped inside. The penitentiary was eerie at night. The silence broken only by the distant hum of the city and the occasional scuttle of unseen creatures in the dark. I swept my flashlight across the crumbling walls, the rusted cell doors. I could almost feel the ghosts of the past, the echoes of pain and despair. I followed the winding corridors, deeper into the heart of the prison. I didn't know where I was going, but I felt pulled, drawn forward. And then I saw it, a faint light coming from one of the cells. I approached slowly, my heart pounding in my chest. The cell door was open, the light spilling out into the corridor. I stepped inside, my breath catching in my throat. The cell was filled with sculptures. They lined the walls, hung from the ceiling, twisted and beautiful and terrifying. And in the center of it all, a figure, the artist. He was tall, gaunt, his face shadowed by the hood of his sweatshirt. He turned to face me, and I saw his eyes. They were like mine, dark, almost black. He smiled, a cold, cruel smile. Art lover 1978, he said, his voice like gravel. Welcome to my studio. I swallowed hard, tried to find my voice. Who are you? I asked. What are these sculptures? What do they do? He chuckled, a sound that sent shivers down my spine. So many questions, he said. But you already know the answers, don't you? You've seen the change. You felt it. I shook my head, denial rising in my throat. 
No, I said. No, that's not... that's not possible. He stepped closer, his dark eyes burning into mine. Isn't it? He asked. Look around you. Look at the world. It's changing. Evolving. And it's all because of them. He gestured to the sculptures, his voice filled with a twisted pride. But why? I asked. Why are you doing this? His smile faded, his face twisting into a snarl. Because the world is broken, he spat. Because people are weak, pathetic. They need to be remade, reshaped. And I am the one to do it. I stared at him, horror washing over me. He was insane, dangerous, and I was alone with him, in the dark heart of the penitentiary. I backed away, my hand reaching for the pepper spray in my pocket. But he was faster. He lunged, his hand wrapping around my wrist. His touch was like ice, like fire burning, freezing. I screamed, tried to pull away, but it was too late. The darkness took me. I woke up in a cell, alone, locked in. The door slammed shut. The key turned. I was cold, my body aching, my mind foggy. I tried to stand, stumbled, caught myself on the rough stone wall. I looked around, my vision swimming. The cell was empty, save for a single sculpture. It stood in the corner, a twisted figure of metal and glass, its eyes seeming to stare right through me. I turned away, my stomach churning. I had to get out. I had to escape. I pounded on the door, screamed for help, but there was no answer. Just the echo of my own voice, mocking me in the darkness. I sank to the floor, despair washing over me. I was trapped, at the mercy of a madman. Hours passed, or maybe it was days. Time lost all meaning in the darkness. I drifted in and out of consciousness, my dreams filled with twisted figures, screaming faces, a world on fire. And always, always the artist, his dark eyes burning into mine, his voice whispering in my ear. You can't escape it, he said. The change is coming. Embrace it. I woke with a start, my heart pounding. The cell was different. The walls were covered in sculptures, their twisted forms seeming to writhe in the dim light. I stared in horror, my breath coming in gasps. They were everywhere, surrounding me, closing in. I scrambled to my feet, backed away. But there was nowhere to go, nowhere to escape. I was trapped, and the sculptures, they were changing, moving, coming to life. I screamed, pressed myself against the cold stone wall. This wasn't real. It couldn't be real. It was a nightmare, a hallucination, a... A test. The realization hit me like a punch to the gut. This was a test. The artist's twisted game. He wanted to see if I could resist the change, if I could fight back. I gritted my teeth, forced myself to look at the sculptures. They were terrifying, yes, but they were also beautiful. In a dark, twisted way, I could see the artistry, the skill, but I could also see the madness, the cruelty, the desire to control, to reshape, to destroy. I took a deep breath, steadied myself. I wouldn't give in. I wouldn't let him win. I would fight. I would resist. I would. The door to the cell creaked open. A figure stood silhouetted in the doorway. The artist. He stepped inside, his dark eyes gleaming. Impressive, he said, his voice like thunder. Very impressive. But the test isn't over yet. He reached out, his hand wrapping around my arm. And the world went dark. I woke up in a different room, a workshop, filled with tools, materials, half-finished sculptures. The artist was there, his back to me, working on something. I watched him, my mind racing. I had to get out, I had to escape. But how? I looked around, my eyes landing on a heavy wrench lying on a nearby table. I reached for it, my hand shaking. I could do this. I could fight back. I could. The artist turned, his dark eyes meeting mine. He smiled, a cold, cruel smile. Ah, you're awake, he said. Good, I need you.
your opinion on something. He gestured to the sculpture he was working on. It was a figure, a woman, her body twisted in pain, her face contorted in a silent scream. I stared at it, horror washing over me. It was me. The sculpture was me. I looked up at the artist, my heart pounding. What are you doing? I asked, my voice barely a whisper. He chuckled, a sound like nails on a chalkboard. Art, he said. I am creating art, and you, my dear, are my muse. He reached out, his hand brushing against my cheek. I flinched away, my fingers tightening around the wrench. No, I said, my voice stronger now. No, I won't let you do this. I won't let you use me. I won't let you win. His smile faded, his face twisting into a snarl. You think you have a choice? He spat. You think you can fight this? You can't. The change is coming. It's inevitable, and you will be a part of it. I shook my head, denial rising in my throat. No, I said. No, I won't. I won't let you do this. I won't let you win. And with that, I swung the wrench. It connected with a sickening thud, the artist staggering back. He looked at me, shock and rage in his eyes. You bitch, he snarled. You fucking bitch. You think you can stop me? You think you can stop the change? I stood my ground. The wrench clutched in my hand. Yes, I said. I do. He lunged, his hands wrapping around my throat. I gasped, choked, struggled to breathe, but I didn't let go of the wrench. I swung again, and again, and again, until he let go, until he fell back, until he lay still on the floor. I stood there, panting, my body shaking. I had done it. I had fought back. I had won, but it wasn't over yet. I had to destroy the sculptures. I had to stop the change. I had to... A noise behind me. A footstep. A voice. Well, 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 it said. Look what we have here. I turned, my heart sinking. It was the police. They had found me. And I was standing over a body. A wrench clutched in my bloody hand. They arrested me. Of course they did. I was covered in blood, standing over a body, a weapon in my hand. They didn't believe my story, about the artist, the sculptures, the change. They thought I was crazy, delusional, a murderer. They locked me up, threw me in a cell, but it didn't matter, because I knew the truth. I knew what was happening, and I knew what I had to do. I had to stop the change. I had to destroy the sculptures, and I had to do it from behind bars. I started small, telling my story to anyone who would listen. The other inmates, the guards, the doctors, they thought I was crazy, of course. But some of them, some of them listened, some of them believed, and some of them started to see the change. I got a lawyer, a good one. She believed me. Or at least, she believed that I believed. She fought for me. Got me a trial. And at that trial, I told my story. About the dark web, the gallery, the artist, the sculptures. About the change. About the fight. About the victory. And the price I paid for it. The jury didn't believe me. Not all of them. But some of them did. Enough of them. They found me not guilty. By reason of insanity. They sent me to a hospital, a place for the criminally insane. But it didn't matter, because I was free. Free to fight. Free to stop the change. I started a movement. From my hospital bed, I wrote letters, made phone calls, sent emails. I told my story over and over again. And people listened. People believed. People started to see the change. And they started to fight back. We found the sculptures, hidden in alleys, in parks, in museums. We destroyed them one by one, until there were none left. And slowly, slowly, the change started to fade. The world started to heal. And I, I started to hope. I'm still here, in the hospital. 
They say I'm crazy, that I'll never be free. But I don't care, because I know the truth. I know what I did. I know what I stopped. And I know that out there, the world is safe. The change is gone. The artist is defeated. And I, I am a hero. But sometimes late at night I see his face. The artist, his dark eyes burning into mine, his voice whispering in my ear. You can't stop it, he says. The change is coming. It's inevitable. And you, my dear, are a part of it. And I wake up sweating, screaming, my heart pounding in my chest. Because I know deep down that it's not over. That he's still out there somewhere, waiting, watching, planning. And I know one day he'll be back. And the change will come again. And I... I will be ready. I will fight. And I will win. Because I am a hero. And this is my story. And it's not over yet. If you like today's tales, don't forget to like and subscribe MM13. Help MM13 get to 1,000 subscribers.